instant for this evening. And our final message for this evening is on that all interesting subject, the mark of the beast. I'd like to invite you to have a word of prayer with me. Would you kneel with me if you're capable of doing so? Father in heaven, Lord, as we seek to open thy word, we ask that you'd open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy law. It is written in your word, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it will be given unto him, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. And so I ask that you'd grant us the wisdom that comes from above, that is first peaceable and gentle, that is easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit. I thank you for your presence, for the Spirit of God coming to teach us. Abide in us, Lord, and we ask this blessing in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles. And we're going to go to the book of Revelation once again, to the same chapter we were looking at earlier, Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation chapter 14, we have contained therein the final warning to humanity. A message of relevance to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people for this time in which we're living. And the Word of God begins to declare in Revelation chapter 14, looking at verse 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue and people saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water and the second angel followed saying Babylon is fallen is fallen that great city because you have made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into his cup of indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Something should be abundantly clear to each and every one of us as we've just read these few verses of Scripture contained within the book of Revelation chapter 14. And that is the final issue in the final crisis on planet Earth will be the issue of worship. It's clearly illustrated. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, humanity is called to worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. And then in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9, we are warned that if any man worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The final crisis on planet earth will be upon the will be upon the battlefield of worship. Who will worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and who will worship the beast? And friends, it's quite interesting that you see that those who will worship the one that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, God declares, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, and they have the faith of Jesus. So something is abundantly clear to me when I look at Revelation chapter 14. Number one, there will be a class of people that will worship the God that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. There will be a people that will not honor the beast or his image. They will not worship him, and there will be a people that will keep the commandments of God, and they will have faith. The faith of Jesus. 
But there will be another class who will not honor the God that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. But they will worship the beast and they will not keep the commandments of God. It's two classes. Now, friends, before I go any further, I want us just to go in the Bible and just clearly identify who is this God that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And you will see as we study together in the Bible that this is not something that's insignificant. It's wholly relevant. Go with me, if you will, to the book of Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10. In Jeremiah chapter 10, if you look at verse 10, the Bible says this. The Lord, he is God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, the gods that have not made the heaven and the earth, even they shall perish from where, friends? Even they shall perish from the earth. Why? Look at the very next verse. Verse 12, he hath made the earth by his power. He hath the earth by his power wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his discretion according to the bible the god that made the earth by his power the god that established the world by his wisdom the god that stretched out the heavens by his discretion in verse 10 this is the god the living god are you with me friends the living God, the true God, is the living God. The living God is the one that's responsible for making the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And every other God is a false God and they will perish from this earth. Do you see that clearly in your Bibles? And so when the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, Fear God and give glory to him and worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. There is a call to the worship of the living God. So in the end, there will be a people that worship the living God and keep his commandments. And there will be a people that worship the beast and disregard the commandment of God. Are you with me, friends? Now, before I get into this issue of the mark of the beast, I want to talk about the seal of God. And the reason I want to talk about the seal of God before I get into the issue of the mark of the beast is because, friends, it should be clear to you this evening that everything that God has, Satan has nothing else but a counterfeit for it. And the mark of the beast is nothing more than a counterfeit of the seal of the living God. Did you hear what I just shared with you? It's nothing more. And we're going to see that with clarity this evening, I pray. If you open your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 7, if you start with me at verse 1, the Bible says this. Revelation chapter 7, and we begin together at the first verse. This is what the Bible says to us. And I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, so that the winds would not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice unto the four angels, unto whom it was given to hurt the earth, and the sea saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. According to the scriptures, right now, God has commissioned his angels to hold back the winds. 
And as we studied, we learned what winds are symbolic of. Actually, in our very first presentation, winds are symbolic of strife, war, bloodshed. He is literally holding back destruction from sweeping through the human family, and he's only doing it for a probationary period of time. How do we know that? Because there was another angel, the Word of God says, that comes ascending from the east, and he doesn't come empty-handed. The Word of God declares that he has within his possession the seal of of the living God. And he cries to the other four angels that are holding the winds, and he says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Which lets me know when God can accomplish the sealing of his servants, then and only then will he deem it safe to commission the angels, it's okay to let the winds loose now. And destruction and calamity will touch down on this earth such as no human pen has the ability to depict. Now friends, before I go any further, I need to make something abundantly clear to you based on the scripture. You are not sealed so you can become a servant. You're sealed because you are a servant. The requirement to be sealed is that you must be a servant. That's what the word of God said. Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. It didn't say seal them to make them servants. You're sealed because you're functioning as a servant. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to be sealed. Because it's very clear from what we saw in Revelation chapter 14, those that receive the mark, they receive the wrath of God. But what I'm seeing thus far from opening the Bible is those that are sealed will receive the protection of God. So which one do you want? Do you want the covering of Christ to be pulled over your head to keep you? Or do you want the mark of the beast on you and the wrath of God hanging over you? I want the seal. And that means that I must live my life as a servant. And you know all are not servants. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 10. I want you to see something. Matthew the 10th chapter. In Matthew chapter 10, there's just something very simple that I want you to see there. It's concerning a servant. Matthew chapter 10, and just briefly look with me, if you will, at verse 24. Just something very simple about a servant. Pay close attention to your Bible and you will see what I'm sharing with you clearly. In Matthew 10 and verse 24, the Bible says, The disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his lord let me say it one more time so that you have it fixed in your mind the disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his lord is it clear to you from this verse of scripture that if you're a disciple that means you have a master if you're a servant that means you have a lord is that clear very good so now, go with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. It's very clear. Matthew chapter 7. And I want you simply to look with me at the words of Jesus in verse 21. This is what Jesus says. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Stop right there. What type of individual would say unto Jesus, Lord, Lord, someone that is claiming to be his servant? Did you get it? Because a disciple has a master and a servant has a? So if they're saying to Jesus, Lord, Lord, they're claiming to be servants. And Jesus said, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, unto me will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So just because you claim to be a servant doesn't mean that you're a servant. 
If you're a servant, you're going to bear the fruits of a servant. That means you must do the will of your father. He didn't say just believe that I'm your Lord. He says you must act like I'm your Lord. That makes a lot of sense to me, friends. I've been to some countries where people still have hired servants. Trust me. When their masters tell them to do something, they do it. And if they don't do what their masters tell them to do, well, you know how this works out next, right? They don't, they don't retain their positions as servants in that household for very long. Friends, listen. Jesus says, just saying I'm your Lord is not sufficient. If I'm really your Lord, that means you're allowing me to reign in your life. And if Jesus is reigning in your life, the Bible says in Philippians 2 and verse 13, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So if the Lord is living and reigning in me, when he asks me to do something, I will to do it and I will perform it, not in my own ability, but because he's living and reigning in me. So if you profess to be a servant, but you don't have the fruits of a servant, then Christ really isn't living in you. Is that clear? And that's, but then somebody says, well, hold on a second. Look what it goes on to say. This is profound. Because if you look at the very next verse of Scripture, it says in verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? Look at what Jesus says next. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. In some versions of your Bible, you will see depart from me, ye that work lawlessness. Interesting. So there are people that are professing to be servants and so called actively in the work of the Lord. But ultimately, God says, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. And friends, if this is not clear for you, iniquity means you are, not, you are knowingly transgressing God's law. Lawlessness. So that tells me in these last days, servants who will be sealed with the seal of the living God, they will know the will of their God, and by faith they will do the will of their God. They will obey. They will not be living in transgression of his law. They will, living, they will be living in obedience to his law. By what? By faith. But those whom he will deny will be a people that may profess high professions, but they will be living in transgression. And transgression is to break the law. I think that's been made clear this week. Serious business, isn't it? So if we want to receive this seal, first things first, friends, we must exercise total faith in Jesus. We must allow him to be the king of our lives, to be our Lord. Because if he truly is our Lord, he works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And he says, the people that continually live their lives walking with me like a man by the name of Enoch, who for 360 years walked with the Lord. God said you to Enoch, you've been walking with me so long, we're closer to my home than we are to yours. Just come on home with me. That's the type of walk that God is looking for us to have with him. He wants us to do his will by faith. 
And the word of God tells us that those that will be found as servants, he will seal them with the seal of the living God in their foreheads. Now, as we learned earlier in the book of Revelation, we have symbolic language. The forehead here is not pointing out that God is going to be placing some literal stamp on our heads. Are you with me, friends? The forehead here is dealing with the frontal lobe. It's dealing with the forefront of our mind. It's dealing with the fact that God wants to place something within our minds. Oh, we have an abundance of scripture for that, by, abundance of scripture for that, by the way. There's something that he wants to place in our minds and seal up within our characters before he deems it safe to deliver us from this earth and bring us into his kingdom with him. Because, friends... When this whole mess of sin is finished, sin is not raising up a second time. Because through the plan of salvation, God is seeking to inoculate us against sin and iniquity. Those that received the seal, they got the, spe they got the spiritual jab. <laughs> What's going on here? Are you with me, friend? That's what's going to happen. Look what the Bible says that God wants to seal up within us, seal up within our characters, seal up within the mind of man. Go with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 16. Isaiah, rather, 8 and verse 16. In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16, I want you to see this, friends. Didn't we see earlier that one who is a servant is one that will do the will of his master, one that will do the will of his Lord, which means he will obey his commandment? Did, did we not see that? Did, did we all see that clearly? A servant will obey the commandment of his, of his Lord very clearly. Well, look at this now. In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16, look what God is going to seal in his servants. We're in Isaiah chapter 8. What verse did I give you? Do you remember? Verse 16. Excellent. It says here, bind up the testimony, seal the law amongst my disciples. Do you see it there clearly? God says, this is what I want to seal in my disciples. I want to seal my law in them. How is God going to seal his law in us? Didn't I tell you earlier that when the word of God tells us that God wants to place his seal in our foreheads, that that is just symbolic language for the fact that God wants to put his seal in our characters, in our minds, and we know what it is that he wants to seal in our minds. It's his law. Yes? Do we have scripture that attests to this as factual? Yes, we do. Go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 10, what many of us know as the new covenant. How many people here are new covenant Christians? I am. No, 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 only one. <laughs> We're in the book of Hebrews, go to chapter 8 rather. Hebrews chapter 8. In Hebrews chapter 8, and we're going to begin together at verse 11. Look closely at the language that's presented to us there. It says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write it in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Now go with me to another scripture. It's still in the book of Hebrews, but we're going to go to chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and let's look at uh, the 16th verse. Hebrews chapter 10, looking at verse 16. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, looking at the 16th verse, 16th verse, it says there, For this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their heart, and in their minds I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Beautiful. So based on Hebrews 10 and based on Hebrews 8, the means by which God is going to seal his law in our minds is he's going to write them in our minds. He's going to write them in our hearts. Did you see that in your Bibles? Yes? Now my question to you is this. How is God going to write his law in our minds? How is God going to write his law in our hearts? He's going to do it the same way he wrote his law the first time. What am I talking about? 
If you open your Bibles with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 31. Do you remember the other day when we were looking at the two different laws? Do you remember that? And we went over to the scripture, and I want you to pay attention to it once again this evening because the information in there is indispensable to what we're investigating at this point in time. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. How did God write the Ten Commandments on stone? What did he use? The Bible says it was written with the finger of God. Excellent. Now, I want you to open your Bibles to the New Testament with me, if you will. And we're going to the book of Luke. And if somebody is saying, wow, this, why is he giving us so much scripture? You know why? Because we've come into a day and age where many times when you step into churches, they give you one or two scriptures and they just start talking for the next hour or two. And unfortunately, this is an easy way for someone to deceive you. But if I give you Bible, and then you have to look at the Bible, and then you can have the opportunity to say, is this guy actually taking this thing out of context, or is he giving it to me as it is written? Now you can be a Berean. Like Paul said, the people in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they heard the word, like you're hearing it tonight, and they didn't just say, okay, that's true. No, they went home and they started studying to see. Is this guy talking the truth or not? So if you're really a noble person, you'll take what you're hearing and say, this sounds very interesting. Now let me investigate this deeply and see if it's true or not. I'm not asking you to believe me. I don't care if you believe me or not. I want us to believe the Bible because I don't have a heaven for anyone. I'm trying to get into the kingdom too. Are you following friends? So let's study together. The Bible tells us, what scripture did I give you? Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, you have to help me find my spot again. Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, and we're at verse 20. Now pay attention. This is an interesting instance because Jesus was being assailed by the Pharisees and they were saying, oh, Jesus, you're casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. <laughs> Ridiculous. But look what Jesus said. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 20, Jesus said, But if I, by the finger of God, cast out what? Then no doubt the kingdom of God has come unto you. Jesus casted out demons by the power of the finger of God. Now, if you go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 12, this is quite interesting. Because as you know, in the Gospels, they repeat the incidents that each other talk about, but in many instances, they give additional information or they might speak of that incident and give something that's interestingly unique to that which was said by uh, one of their fellow apostles. And here we see same incident where the Pharisees are accusing Jesus of casting out devils by the power of Beelzebub. And I want you to see what the Bible says. Are you in the book of Matthew chapter 12? I mean, Matthew chapter 12, are you there? Yes. In Matthew chapter 12, looking at verse 28, Jesus said, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Did you see that? Jesus said, he casted out devils by the finger of God. And then Jesus said he casted out devils by the Spirit of God because the work of the Spirit of God is the work of the finger of God. It is the power of God that's being exercised. If you're following, say amen. Now, friends, listen to this point. It's very important. Because as we saw in the book of Exodus 31 and verse 18, the finger of God is what wrote the law on tables of stone. The finger of God has the power to remove, evict the power of the enemy from ruling in our lives so that the presence of God can establish its dominance in our hearts. No, his dominance in our hearts. Are you following, friends? The Spirit of God is the one 
that will bind the strong man Satan and establish the presence of Christ in us and begin to write the law of God in our minds and in our hearts. That's why the scripture says that we are sanctified by the Spirit. How does the Spirit sanctify us? The Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Spirit sanctifies us by embedding the truth in us. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into some truth. All truth. His work is to write the law of God on our minds and in our hearts so that God's Holy constitution can be established in us so that we can be fit citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Powerful friends. So in truth, when God sends his spirit into us, he is sending the work of the seal in us because the spirit's work is to write the law in our hearts and in our minds. That's why the scripture says, go with me to the book of Ephesians, go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, I want you to look with me at verse 30, in Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verse 30, Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verse 30, the Bible says, and grieve not the Spirit of God, grieve not the Spirit of God. Don't hurt the heart. Don't, don't push away the Spirit of God. Grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The work of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth to write the truth in our hearts and in our minds, to empower us to live in obedience to the truth, and to keep us in this state of obedience until the day that Jesus comes to retrieve us. Until the day of redemption. Because the Spirit in you, when God sees His Spirit working in us, He says, that one right there is my possession. Are you with me, friends? That one right there has my name on them. What we're looking at is how God seals us. And friends, I want to say something before I go any further. This is not some arbitrary thing that God does. It's not just something where we say, okay, I believe and that's it. Something powerful about our God, and, he, and that is that he gives us the freedom of choice. You know, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily and follow me. In other words, daily I have to make the decision to pick up my cross. That means daily I have to make the decision to follow Jesus. That means daily I have to make the decision that I'm going to love Jesus more than anything else in this life. I made a statement the other day to my friend as I was walking in, as we were driving together in the car, and I made this statement to you the other evening, and I'm going to say it one more time. Friends, true love demands true choice. There can be no such thing as true love without true choice. If I don't have the ability to choose you, how can I truly love you? But when I choose you out of everyone else to be the one whom I bestow the fullness of my affections, you know that love is true. I have a wife. We've been married for years. <laughs> he says, <"It's> years. <laughs> I could wake up tomorrow morning and say I don't want to be married anymore and leave her. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? I could wake up tomorrow morning and say I don't want to be with her anymore and leave her. But I haven't done that and I have no intention of doing that because every day when I wake up, I choose to love her. And I choose again that I want to be in this relationship with this woman. 
God wants a people that in this life will choose him over and over again. Because if we'll choose him over and over again in this life of sin, it says this one right here, they'll choose me over and over again throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Do you understand? Friends, those are the types of people that are going to be in the kingdom. We must choose to cooperate with God by surrendering our hearts to him daily. Surrendering our wills to him daily. Even Jesus proved that to us in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26 and the weight of the sins of the world were placed on him. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. In other words, he said, Father, I know I came here to die for them, but right now this doesn't feel comfortable. So if there's another way for us to accomplish the salvation of humanity, then let's do that. But you know what? That's just humanity talking. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus made a choice to submit his will to the Father's will. He taught us by example, that we must always be willing to submit our will to the Father's will. And when we submit our will to the Father's will, then the Father's will will be done. But the Father will never take our will from us. But if we ask him to help us, he will empower our wills so we can choose to do what is right. That's what the Word of God says. And we must choose to follow God's instruction. I want you to see something very interesting. Go with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, you know, friends, before we go any further, I'm sure that some of you here have heard about this thing called the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13. As you turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6, in Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse 15, it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich, and he hath power to give life unto the image of the beast, rather, so that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And it goes on to say this, And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, so that no man might buy nor sell, save he that have the mark of the beast or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Notice the mark of the beast can be placed in the forehead or in the, in particular it says the right hand. Do you see that in your Bibles? Do you know this is Satan just counterfeiting what God wants to do? Did you know that? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want you to see this. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 6, these are the words of God. He says, and these words which I've commanded you this day shall be in your heart, and ye shall teach them diligently to thy children, and thou shalt talk of, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And look what it goes on to say. And it shall be as a what? Sign upon thine hand, and as frontlets between thine eyes. Notice he said, when, friends, he says, this is the way that my law is going to be in your heart. Teach it diligently to your children. Not only that, when you're sitting down in your house, talk of it. By the way, that word talk, it doesn't just mean speak, it means commune. You know you can commune with God in your heart. He says pray without ceasing. 
He says, talk of it. I want you to be speaking of it. When you sit down at the table with your family, talk about it. When you're sitting by yourself, talk to yourself. Talk to Jesus. Commune with the Lord in your heart. Pray without ceasing. He says, and, and, and not, when, not just when you're sitting down, but when you're walking by the way, talk to me while you're walking by the way. Talk of it. When you lay in your bed before you fall asleep, that's what you should be thinking about. When you rise up in the morning, guess what's the first thing? Man, brothers and sisters, you know the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs 4 and verse 23? No, no, no. Proverbs 23, it tells us there, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you're continually thinking about that law, and, that, and, and it's not just talking about the law, it's the word. If you're continually thinking on God's word, sharing God's word, communing on God's word, and you know you can do this when you're working. You say, how can I do that when I'm working? When you're working, well, how can I do that when I'm digging a ditch? When you're digging a ditch, you can say, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do with all your might. Huh? If you're doing surgery, and you're being a surgeon as you're doing it, you can say, I will praise thee, O Lord, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. There's not one thing in life where God's word cannot be in your mind. He would not tell you, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, for his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. God wouldn't say that if it wasn't possible. Remember when we looked in the sanctuary yesterday and we saw in the north was the table of showbread? How often was that bread on the table? Day and night. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He is the word of God. It should be in our hearts day and night. Let me tell you something. I see some people on social media day and night. I see some people talk nonsense day and night. You remember when you first fell in love with that young man or young woman, even if they didn't love you, you were thinking about them day and night. Okay, just tell me I'm lying. <laughs> tell me I'm lying. You know, when people are in love with people, they look for reasons to talk about them. And it's those the most obscure things. You're over there like this and picking up a napkin. Oh, you know the... The, the, the design on this just reminds me of her dress so much. What are you talking about? You just want to talk about her. Friends, we should just want to talk about Jesus. We should just want to talk about him. And the word of God says when Jesus is not just something, someone that we talk about in formal settings. But when Jesus becomes a part of our informal existence, when we're laying down, when we're rising up, when we're talking to our children, when we're sitting down, when we're walking by the way, everywhere I go, I go with Jesus. God says, when you do this, it will be as a sign upon your hand and in your mind. Your, life, your thoughts will be transformed. Your works will be conformed. Front links between your eyes dealing with the thoughts, the character. On the hand, your works. Because Jesus is in you. Same thing will happen with the mark of the beast. If you're not living for Jesus and you're allowing the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life to lead you away, if you're drinking the wine of Babylon because you're sucking down this world's deceptions that are being promoted to you in many churches that are teaching false doctrine on Netflix, which is teaching you nothing but evil in this world that is promoting to you nothing but the corruption of Satan and you're not seeking to stay your mind on Jesus, step by step, moment by moment, you are allowing the principles of iniquity to be a in your heart, preparing yourself for the final reception of the mark of the beast. It 
It's that real. But God's servants, they will receive the seal of the living God. Do you notice that it didn't just say the seal of God in Revelation chapter 7, but it said the seal of the living God? Did we learn in Isaiah 8 and verse 16 that those who receive the seal of the living God will have the law placed in them? Did we not all see that together? That's very interesting. Because we also learned that the living God is the one that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Did we learn that? That means that those who receive the seal of the living God, they will keep all of God's commandments, including the commandment that identifies that the God of the commandments is the one that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. A commandment that identifies who the author of the commandments is. A commandment that identifies by whose authority those commandments were given. You know there's only one commandment that identifies that? You think it's coincidental? Do you think that we can look at this many scriptures and just be happening upon a coincidence? We're not going to do it. If you look in the book of Exodus chapter 20, go there with me, friends. We're looking at the fourth commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to see something quite interesting in a second. You see, because... Somebody said, I want to hear about the mark of the beast. No, what you want to hear is about is the seal of the living God. I'm going to tell you why. You've ever heard about those people that are counterfeit detectors? Dete you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, let me go to this statement. You know what they do when they want people to be able to detect counterfeit bills? They leave them with the genuine article. Spend as much time with the genuine article as possible. So that as soon as a counterfeit is placed in front of them, they know immediately that ain't it. Because they've handled the genuine article so much, they can smell a counterfeit from a mile away. If we can understand the genuine article, friends, you will see the counterfeit clearly if you want to. Exodus 20 and verse 8. In Exodus 20 and verse 8, the Bible tells us, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, not your secular work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle nor the stranger that is within thine gates. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. What God is that? The living God. And rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Friends, what we see in Exodus 20 and verse 8 is the seal of the living God placed on the Ten Commandments. We see identified the God that the Lord tells us in these last days must be worshipped. The one that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. The one who will place his seal on his servants. It is the living God. The Lord of Sabbath. Jesus. Jesus. For, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. And without him was not anything made that was made. First John, excuse me, John rather, 1 and verse 2. But on the other side of the spectrum, we will have those that will worship the beast. And we learn this evening that those that worship the beast, they will not honor the living God. They will not keep his commandments. He said, what beast are we talking about? Run with me quickly as we're coming to a close now. Revelation chapter 13, I want you to look with me at verse 1. In Revelation 13, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says this. Revelation chapter 13, beginning at the first verse, the Bible says this. And I, John, stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon its horns ten crowns, and upon its heads the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. 
and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. Let's stop right there for a second. We learned this week that a beast in Bible prophecy, according to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17, and Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23, a beast in Bible prophecy is a symbol of a kingdom. That is a political power. Is that true or false? And then when we look over here in the book of Daniel, excuse me, in the book of Revelation chapter 13, we see a beast, a political power, but it's no ordinary political power. How do we know that, friends? Because on its forehead and on its head, meaning its intrinsic character, is that it's blasphemes. Did you see that in your Bible? Blasphemy. Is that a secular terminology or is that a religious terminology? Blasphemy is 100% a religious term. That means we're looking at a political power that engages in religious activity. And we learned what blasphemy is this week, Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. If a man professes he can forgive sin, that's blasphemy. We learned what blasphemy is this week, John chapter 10 and verse 33. If a man claims to be God, claims the prerogatives of God for himself, that is blasphemy. This is a political power that has a head of state that claims he can forgive sin and claims that he is in the position of God himself. There is no other power other than the papacy that fits that description. None other, friends. And you know what this beast seeks after? Look in the Bible with me, Revelation chapter 13. It's right there in your Bibles. In Revelation, the 13th chapter, the Bible tells us clearly in verse 4, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This power is seeking after what? Worship. What power? We are the papal power. The Roman Catholic Church. Yes. And friends, let me say something. What we're learning about this evening, it's not something unique to Seventh-day Adventism. Do you realize that every Protestant church throughout antiquity taught that the papacy was the beast of Revelation chapter 13? The Presbyterians taught it. The Baptists taught it. The Methodists taught it. They all taught it. Even Isaac Newton taught it. I guess he really did have a light go off. Friends, but you know something? There's an old hymn. It's called Once to Every Man and Nation. Some of you might know it. There's a line in there that I'll never forget. It says, time makes, makes ancient good, ancient truth rather, seem uncouth. Do you understand that? In other words, with the, with, the, with the passing of time, things that people always knew to be true, then they begin to say that's foolishness. And we're actually seeing that in the day and age in which we live. We used to know that it was true that there was only two, gen two genders. Now society's saying those who think like that are uncouth. Am I telling the truth? There was a time in this nation, in the world, where we said no one should smoke marijuana. It's not good for you. Now that way of thinking is antiquated, uncouth. Can you imagine the same thing is happening with God's truth? Things that we always knew to be true, now all of a sudden, Oh, we're going to relegate that to the box of history. You better go pull out the box of history because history is getting ready to repeat. Friends, it is that power and it's seeking after worship. And you know what this system sought to do from the very beginning? Go back with me to the book of Daniel chapter 7. I want you to see this for yourselves, friend. And if I'm being animated this evening, it's because I have a burden. Daniel, the seventh chapter, if you look with me at verse 25, because we learned that the little horn power in Daniel chapter 7 is the prophetic counterpart in the book of Daniel of this very beast in Revelation chapter 13. They're one and the same, just being presented to us under different symbolism, but their characteristics line up one by one. 
The Bible told us that the papal power in the book of Daniel, chapter 7 and verse 25, it would speak great words against the Most High. It would wear out the saints of the Most High. Are you reading your Bibles, friends? It would wear out the saints of the Most High. And look what else it said it would do. It would think to change times and... And whose times and laws would they seek to change? God's. This is the beast power. Remember, all he does is counterfeit. Now you tell me, what law connected to time does God have that that system sought to change? The Sabbath. They tell you in their own lectures, their own literature, their own books. Sunday is our mark of authority. You can search your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You will find not one scripture that sustains Sunday as a day of rest. It has been established by the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I was a history major, and I believe don't try to rewrite history. But if you don't remember it, you're doomed to repeat it. Friends, this power is going to do the opposite. God's true servants will honor him. They will keep his commandments, including the seventh-day Sabbath. They will walk by faith in Jesus. Those who receive the mark of the beast, they will, they will not honor the living God. They will not keep God's commandments. But on the contrary, this system seeks to set up its own law connected to time, and it's a false Sabbath. It will be Sunday. Now listen closely, friends. Sunday is not the mark of the beast. When Sunday is legislated, we will see the mark of the beast. Did you understand what I just said? Somebody said makes no sense because the Bible says those that receive the mark of the beast, they will neither be able to buy nor sell. Friends, the effect is not the cause. Did you hear what I just said? I'll say it differently. If you do not receive the mark, the result will be you can't buy or sell. If you refuse the worship, you will not be able to buy ourselves. Friends, the mark of the beast can't be a microchip. You know why? It's connected to worship. And you know what is necessary for worship? Choice. What's necessary for worship? Choice. If a microchip is the mark of the beast, that somebody's going to implant under my skin. That means if you're strong enough to pin me down, I'm a goner. Did you understand? If you're strong enough to pin me down and inject me, I'm done. It's okay. It was funny. It's okay. No, friends. Worship is something that one must give by choice. And guess what? Even Satan wants worship via choice. You say, where do you get that from? I get it from the Bible. You don't believe it? Okay, let's see it. I'll give this my last scripture. Go with me to the book of, let's go to the book of Matthew. 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 Where are we going now? In Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew the fourth chapter. Matthew chapter 4, 
in Jesus' temptation in the 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, the final temptation, the enemy came to him and took him up into exceeding high mountain, the Bible says, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them in verse 8. And then in verse 9, listen to the words of Satan to Jesus. And he saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. He wanted him to choose. I'll give it to you, but you must fall down and worship me. Did he take Jesus and push him to the ground? Did he have the power to take Jesus and push him to the ground? Yes, he did. How do you know he had the power to take Jesus and push him to the ground? He had the power to take Jesus and lift him up and take him to an exceeding high mountain. He had the power to lift Jesus up and take him to the top of the temple. You didn't see that in your Bible? He flew him up to the pinnacle of the temple and told him to cast himself down. Second temptation. Final temptation, he takes him up to an exceeding high mountain. If he had the power to take Jesus and fly him up to the top of Mount Everest, you think he didn't have the power to push him down to the ground? Of course he did. But he said, to get worship, you've got to choose me. I need you to choose me. Fall down in worship. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And true servants of the living God will worship the Lord our God, and him only will we serve, because he alone made us. He alone died for us. And he alone is interceding for us, preparing a place for us, and coming back again to get us. Fear God and give glory to him. So here the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be bad. What are you going to receive? Are you going to receive the seal of the living God, or are you going to receive the mark of the beast? That is your decision. May God help each one of us to make right choices. As you listen to this song, I want you to think, what is the choice that you want to make?